Hello there, World of Tankers, and welcome to the channel. I'm your host, Drudels Blitz, and in today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the Swedish Heavies. This is one of the most dangerous lines of tanks that you can roll up against, being the Emil 1, the Emil 2, and the Kranvon. In today's video, we are going to be taking a look at all of these vehicles. I'll be showcasing their capabilities to you, and why I absolutely love playing the tanks in this line. Now, to get up to the Emil 1, you are going to have to grind the Leo and the Stritzvon 74. Honestly, the Stritzvon is basically just an average tier 6 tank. There's not much going for it. Uh, the tier 7 Leo is also a pretty fun tank, but it's kind of mediocre in its armor. It's not very fast. It's just one of those vehicles you're like, okay, I gotta grind it, and now I'm done. I'm at the Emil. It's not a bad experience. It's not a good experience. It's just a experience. The Emil 1 is really where things start to take off, and in a really good way. This vehicle features armor, decent mobility, very solid DPM for an autoloader. It's kind of got it all. So let's talk about it. First of all, we have the gun. It's a three shell, 320 damage per shot clip, which means that even if you're up against tier nines like the WZ111 GFT or the VK45 on their team, we can still easily out trade them if we have the opportunity to pen our shells. But there are some downsides with the gun. Its dispersion is 0.35, which is pretty bad, I'm gonna be honest, especially for such a low alpha damage. The aiming time is not the best either, we can see that here. You can run reticle calibration on this vehicle, but I don't know if you want to take away two repair kits to do that, because you also kind of want to run speed boost as the vehicle only achieves a top speed of 35, with a pretty meh power to weight. So, yeah, mobility-wise, the tank isn't winning any awards, and neither is it winning anything in the accuracy department. But in terms of DPM, it's got over 2,000. It has around 230 mils of AP penetration. Its premium is pretty mid, though. It's only got about 250 mils of premium pen, which is not a lot, especially when you're going to be going up against tier 8 and 9s that can be heavily armored like the Tiger II or really any of the German tanks. So we have a Jagdpanther II in front of us. I'm not really going to make any aggressive moves until I see that I have support from my team, and there you go. We have an enemy VK, and also a great example of the accuracy of this gun. We completely missed a very easy shot. So this VK is going to try and side scrape. We're not able to pen him anywhere there, so it's a good example of the armor on that tank being very hard to actually cut through. We have the enemy WZ in front of us. I don't want to be shot by that. Our E50 is going to be. Yep, there goes 765 off the E50. Not much I can really do about that. I'm going to try and ignore the WZ if I can, very briefly. And we're going to push the Swindler. This player is going to regret life as we're going to ram him and get a nice 355 chunk. But, uh, yeah, I can say that life has been better because right now it's looking pretty bad. I'm going to put on my super speed boost. This is what's great about this tank is that it does feature the super speed. And if you're in a situation that you can't get out of, you activate it and there you go. Boom, you're gone. So that's quite nice, and it's something I've always enjoyed about this style of vehicle. What I don't enjoy is my team, but there's nothing you can really do about bad players. We have the E50s most likely going to die to the WZ, but that's okay. We're going to aim it on the rear of his tank. We're going to get one pen into his vehicle. We're going to aim it again. We're going to get a second pen in. And we also have the Lorraine, who we're going to get that third pen into. That's a pretty solid chunk of 1,200 damage we've been able to get out. However, I don't know how much it's going to matter when we have two autoloaders rushing up our bum and we're in a tank that uh, obviously, again, does not win in the mobility department. But we're going to chill here. we got about five seconds left before we get our clip, so we're going to just wait a little bit longer. And in three, two, one, let's see what we can do. I'm not going to worry about that player at all in the WZ. I'm just going to try and clip the defender. We got one 330 damage shell. We get two shells, that's a 354, and we get our third out as well for 272. That was a pretty good damage uh, game for us. 2,200 is not bad. I guarantee that is double the next highest on the team. I guess we're going to do two battles in the Emil. That showcased nothing about the tank's capabilities, but I guess it showed two things. Uh, the fact that the DPM is decent enough that you can get out some quick shells. You know, that was 2,200 damage when the next highest on my team was 1200 so you really can't blame the tank in that situation there it's definitely not the tank's fault and you saw how we activated that super speed boost which allowed us to get out of any trouble we were in very quickly because the tank reverses at 20. so when you have a super speed boost which bu buffs that by an additional 10 you can go 30 kilometers per hour in reverse in a heavy 
it's kind of crazy. So, in that regard, I do really like the Anil. I think it's an incredible tank when you're able to use the mobility properly. Obviously, it requires some uh, patience to wait for the right time to use your super speed, but uh, we're going to see if we can do that. Of course, our Stratvon 81 and CS don't want to make their way up the bridge, because why would you want to do your job as a medium? But I will still be making my way up the bridge, as this tank has good turn armor, and it appears that I do have support from a TS-60. So, at least we got that going for us. Of course, with my luck, the entire enemy team is going to rush our two mediums that went alone over there, and then it'll still be in the same boat as our last battle. But we'll see. As I uh, previously mentioned, this is one of those tanks that if you get it hauled down, it's going to be in its strongest position. We actually had a shell blind fired at it. No, it might have been the TS-60. I don't really know. It's hard to tell. But we're just going to keep on going up this bridge, and we're going to see if we spot anybody in front of us. Doesn't look like that is the case, so we're just going to head straight down this road here. I would expect to see the enemy mediums or heavies trying to cross this road. There you go, we got the Pantera spotted right in front of us. We're actually going to aim at an HE shell. Well, we don't pen the HE, but what we do is track the Pantera in the open, which means we're able to get one, we're able to get two, and three shells out. We didn't pen the first one. I mean, we did 100 damage, so it's better than nothing, but obviously we didn't do anything huge. But it's still nice that we were able to take probably close to 750 damage off of that player. We have the Borsik, who's running into mid. And that really doesn't worry me at all, to be honest, because we already see a clear shot on this Borsig, but looks like he was able to actually get into cover. We have the IS-2 shielded in front, and we tracked him with the first shot, which obviously did nothing. We also have the Stritzvon 81 all the way in the back. They're just, they're not poking enough for me to be able to hit them, so we're just going to have to drive out a little bit more. Ah. Yeah, again, you can see the uh, pretty mediocre accuracy on this vehicle at distance here. It's not great. We've dealt a thousand damage at this point, and I'm trying to just think of where we should position our vehicle. Their team's kind of just camping for the most part, and it's not making it easy to choose where's the best area. I'm going to move up, though. I think this is a pretty easy win as long as we play this properly. We have a fairly healthy Stritzvon, and the rest of our team's doing pretty well here. So my, my thinking is that we can push the Borsig, which is what we're going to do. We're going to put on our super speed. We're going to clear the Borsig, and then we're going to push over here to the T23E3, who was last spotted. Hopefully, we're going to be able to catch him. There you go. One shell to the T23. Nice roll as well, 385. We get a second shell for 308. Do you see how fast that thing reverses? It's actually one of the fastest reversing tanks in Tier 7. It's kind of crazy. But you'll notice that his vehicle has literally no chance of cutting through me frontally. I was just really hoping we could ram him, which we obviously were not able to do there, which is a little bit uh, annoying, but shouldn't matter too much. He's going to bounce me again, and we're going to get the clearing shell. We're going to instantly start reloading our clip, as this is again another defeat, most likely. We've been really getting the lottery here with uh, great teams today. Well, 13 seconds left, and we will have our clip loaded. We're just going to drive down here, and we're going to wait in a little bit of peace and quiet while we get this clip. Oh man, I don't know how much health they have, but I know the Bisante is fairly healthy, which is obviously going to be a pretty big problem. Alright, well, let's just wait, and, uh, oh, we're spotted from what? I don't know. I don't even know where we could be detected from, but that's just classic World of Tanks for you. <laughs> oh well. Oh, we got the Stritzvon in front. There you go, nice clearance of the Stritzvon. We have the, uh, enemy Yek, Kanon, and Yag. We get a nice clearance of him. And we have the IS-2 in front, who we get a nice shell into as well. That was pretty good. We actually just took what was an entire team and pretty much brought them down a couple pegs, which is obviously quite nice. But the Bisante, unfortunately, had a bit of a brain cell. And because of that, was able to completely outposition us. Very, very annoying. Oh, and he pens both shells. That is really, really bad. All right, well, we're going to load gold, and we're going to cut... Oh, well, we're not going to cut through his turret. Okay, well, uh, we're going to pen him in the upper plate at least. And we're going to pen him out the upper plate again. That first shell would have been great if it had penned. However, it didn't, which is obviously... Oh, man. Yeah. Just doesn't matter what we do here. Very unfortunate. We did good. I mean, again, we got four kills. We basically held. And we took advantage of the situations when we needed to. But 3060 is not enough to win a tier 8 battle nowadays due to the way the matchmaker works. So, oh well. The Mil-1 is a fantastic tank. It's got a great gun, and as we saw, its armor works pretty well. But it's only good when you're hauled down. You'll notice on flat ground, people are going to cut right through your tank. And there's not much you can really do about it. So now we're going to move on to the Mil-2. Now this is the first auto-reloader on the line. And 
It's actually quite an incredible tank in that regard. It features a super dangerous clip of 1,200 damage. That is 300 more than the previous vehicle. Not only does it have more clipping potential, but it also gains a lot in the penetration department. You can cut through a lot of tier 10s with this vehicle quite easily where the Emil is going to struggle in that area. And as an auto reloader, you're not an auto loader anymore. The difference between these two play styles is absolutely monstrous. The Emil, you dump the clip, you back up, you reload. With the Emil 2, you not only have the ability to dump the clip, but then you have the ability to shoot as a single shot, which is incredibly nice, and it allows you to very easily take advantage of situations in front of you. I personally think auto reloaders are the strongest class of vehicles in the game. To be fair, I don't think the heavies are as capable as the mediums in the auto reloading department. I think the Caro and the Progetto have much stronger areas because they have faster clip reloads and higher DPM. But the Mil 2 and the Kron are both getting up there in the DPM department. In fact, the Kron effectively has close to 2,400 damage per minute now, which is quite a bit, surprisingly, for vehicles that used to only break about 2,000. So here we are. In our first game for the Emil 2, we're going to do two battles in this tier 9. I was only planning on doing one battle in the tier 8, but we got a really bad team, so I said let's do one more. However, in this tank, we're going to do two battles, and uh, we'll do three games in the tier 10. So, the Emil 2, what does it have going for it? Well, it's obviously pretty mobile. It's not as mobile as the Emil 1, but it's got a better power to weight which makes it feel a little bit more enjoyable, but its top speed is about 5 kilometers per hour slower. This vehicle only reaches 30. Turret armor-wise, it is stronger, but it's not stronger tier for tier. I trust the Emil's armor more in tier 8 than I do in this vehicle against tier 9s, if that makes sense. But it's still a very solid turret, and as I said, the gun is the major selling point on this vehicle. It's the fact that it hits for 400. It's not the most accurate, so you will you know, have to worry about that, but it's not the biggest deal ever. We're just going to wait a little bit longer, and we're going to get our uh, our shell reloaded here. We have the side of the uh, Luva turret, but we're not really able to do much to him yet. I'm going to wait for him to drive out, and there you go. There's one 360 damage shot, two shells into his vehicle, and we're going to reload one more. There you go. That was a pretty bad clip as well, only dealing about 1,050 damage, but we still nuked everything on that Luva. Now here's the interesting thing about the Emil is that it actually has more damage per minute as a single shot than it does as a clipper. That's weird. I know the Kron is the opposite. The Kron, the more shells you shoot, the less effective damage per minute you have. But in this tank, the more you shoot, the more DPM you have. It's weird, but that's something that you should always keep in mind. So it's actually beneficial to just full-on dump your clip in this tank, where it's not beneficial to do that in the Kron. So we got the motion in front, and I'm just going to chill here. We're going to wait for our full clip, because we're already on the reload anyway. And then once we get the shell, we're going to drive up. We're going to aim it on the side of the motion. We got hit by, it appears, the ISU-130, which is not... Oh, really? Either way, we got hit by the ISU-130, and he managed to slam that shell right into the side of our tank. So with that... Oh, no, not ISU-130. ISU-152, I guess he really low-rolled it. Unless maybe they have a camping IS-3, but I don't really think that's the case. Either way... Bruh, does this tiger have to stop right in front of us? <laughs> Either way, we have the ISU in front of us over here, and personally, I would love if this ISU just rolled around the corner, and he did. I'm not really sure why, but, uh, bye. Interesting play, bro. Uh, <laughs> zero. That might be the worst situational awareness I've ever seen. Alright, we're gonna finish off the T-49. So, that's pretty good so far. We're at 2,780 damage. I'll admit the enemy team has a collective IQ of probably about 10, but that's not much I can do about it. We're going to wait for our second shell to load just because of the fact we're already on the reload for it. If you're already, you know, a couple seconds into your reload, it's going to be more beneficial to actually wait for that shell to reload. Ow. Okay, well, it's not beneficial if your shot does that, but we got the second shell out at least into the motion. And now we're on single shot. Again, single shot DPM is the highest for this tank. So you're actually going to find the most success when shooting this vehicle at your opponents like this. All right, well, we're already getting up pretty good damage here. We are up to 3,400, and every subsequent shell is just more damage added to our uh, our table here. Hopefully we can break the 4K barrier. Not when your shell does that, though. The accuracy, as we can see, is kind of just like the Emil, where it's a little bit derpy, and shells that should be easy to pen are the ones that miss the most. So we're just going to drive right over towards this IS-3. We're going to wait a teeny bit longer just to get our second shell loaded here. 
three, a two, a one, and let's see if we can get a bonk into you. Nice. And then all that's left is the ISU in front of us over here, and we should be able to get the pen into him, hopefully. Let's just drive up the hill. I don't really care if the ISU shoots me. There you go. 95. I think that's just enough to top us over the 4,000 damage mark. So that was a pretty good game. And it shows where hull down tanks dominate the ridge lines. I mean, that was obviously the ultimate map to drive a vehicle like the Emil on. And uh, it was pretty easy to just sit there with no stress whatsoever, shoot our opponents, and come out with one of the easiest victories ever. So let's do one more game in the Emil 2, and let's see if it can obviously do just as well. But yes, dumping your clip in this tank is the most effective way to deal damage. I don't know why Wargaming didn't change that when they changed the Kron, but yeah, don't dump all of your shells in the Kron unless you want to do that. It's not like a huge DPM difference, it's only about 300. So like in the Kron, you'll have 2400 DPM if you shoot it on single shot and then dump the clip. And if you dump the clip immediately, you'll have about 2100 DPM. This tank, you'll have like 2000 DPM if you shoot it on single shot and then dump the clip and you'll have about 2100 if you just dump the clip immediately. So they're basically the same, to be honest, but it's still kind of cool that you don't need to worry about how many shells you have. All right, either way, we're going to head into the front here. We have an E-75 and another E-75, but that one being the TS variant. Now, while this vehicle may not feature the highest top speed, it does actually have, as I said before, pretty good power to weight. So you will out-accelerate a lot of the heavies you have on your team. So you don't feel incredibly immobile, you just don't feel very fast in this tank. We get a nice slap into the side of the M103. Good thing we were able to move over here. This is a very good early game position, because you are able to spot people that are in crossing positions, basically lock them down. We can also see the object 704 mounts right off of my turret. That is indeed why I'm running enhanced armor on this vehicle rather than, um, you know, more HP, improved assembly, because it's just better to have more armor on this vehicle's turret. So we get another shell into the motion, and we're going to aim it again and get another shell. So we have already blocked 1,800, and we have also dealt about, what, 1,500? Yeah, 1,500 damage. Kind of crazy when you think about it. This is why the auto-reloading mechanic is so dangerous because you could not have been able to deal that amount of damage we've done so far in any other class of vehicle. I mean, yeah, an auto-loader would have been able to get out 1,200, but there's no way it would have been able to get out that last chunk. So we're going to wait here five more seconds, then we're going to absolutely dunk on this poor ISU defender. I think he's just waiting peacefully for his clip to reload, but what he doesn't realize is that we're right in front of him. We're going to get one shell, we're going to get two shells, we've tracked him, and uh, yeah, say goodbye to the IS-3 defender. There you go. Looks like we also had an auto-loader. The Defender Mark 1 was shooting him. So already that player's gone. Just like that. Again, kind of crazy how fast you can rip into your players with this vehicle. So we have the motion, and what I most likely want to shoot here is the AFK Caliban. However, I don't even know if we're going to be able to shoot him before uh, before it's over. I guess what we can do, though, is we can get behind the M103 and get to at least two shells out in his tank. We'll just aim it on his lower plate. There's a 425 shot and a nice 416. There you go. That's 3,504 dealt. You know, people all the time tell me, oh, these tanks don't have any DPM. Oh, you can't get that much damage out in a tank that has, you know, very little uh, damage output. But clearly, as we've seen here, even in a battle that only lasts about two minutes from the start of me shooting, I'm still able to get out 3,000 damage easily. And that's kind of how the Emils are. It's very easy when you have a 1,200 damage clip loaded at the beginning of the game to get out over 3k damage. I mean, if you have 2,000 DPM and you have 1,200 damage loaded in the barrel immediately, that means that you technically can get out 3,000 damage in less than a minute, which is kind of crazy. So there you go. 3,504 damage dealt, and obviously top on the team with that result. Not much effort needed to be expelled there. So now we move on to the big daddy of the line, the Kron. This vehicle ups it to a whole nother level in the turret armor. To be fair, our armor is working fantastic. Even the 704 mounts just right on the turret. So it's not like the armor was a problem on this vehicle, but there will be situations where higher heat pen heavies can cut right through the Emil 2. Where in the Kron, that is not even a reality. I'm not even running the armor on this vehicle because you don't need to. That's how strong the turret is. The DPM on this tank, as I said, is a lot more effective. If we take a look at the effective DPM, it is 2,286 if you're shooting the vehicle dumping the whole clip, and it's about 2,386 if you're shooting the vehicle on the most effective. That's pretty good, and it 
It actually shows that this vehicle can hold its own if you use it properly. The Kron is about the same mobility as the Emil 2. Slightly faster on overall top speed. I think it can go 34 ish kilometers per hour so with super speed boost you can get up to 39 it reverses too slower instead of 20 it's 18 but again basically the same in that area my favorite thing about the cron is the fact that it has a lot more pen and it also just is basically unstoppable on a ridge line it allows you to feel absolutely dominant with really very little ways to take this thing out so we're obviously going to hopefully load into a battle here all right here we are black goldville for our first game and we're going to see what we can do here up against us we have a concept e6 vk72 all right well, that's three heavies not too bad we are going to head over towards the medium route which is where you should always go on black goldville town is just it's like an okay spot but the problem is the medium position is just better. It's easier for everybody to get there. There's a lot more positions for the mediums to hold. I don't mind going town. It's just, what are the mediums supposed to do in the town? That's the real problem there. This map is too large, and it's too separated on the heavy to the medium side. You know, if the game was 10 versus 10, maybe it would make sense, but it's not. It's 7 versus 7, so the map isn't large enough to have two separate flanks. We can see the E6 spotted in mid, and our 50 TP prototype is trying to at least deal with that a little bit. We are going to make our way right through here, and let's see, E6 is not bonked. Very sad. That's a pretty easy shot, but it just went a little bit too low because that we weren't able to get the shell out. All right, well, we have the E6 still in front of us, and there you go. Heat shell cuts right through his turret. That's where the increased heat penetration over the ML2 feels very nice, and you're able to basically butter through any armor. So, we have the 5041 who was last spotted right in front of us, and I'm going to head right over towards that 5041. That player does not scare me even remotely. The only reason I'm a little worried is because I think my Leopard and 54 are going to nuke the guy before I get there, so I'm kind of hoping... Oh, he backs up. There you go. We actually get one shell out into his vehicle right there, but we're not able to get the second one out as he backs in front of the Leopard, which blocks our shots. Well, that's fine. We've already got our shell loaded. You can see how much faster the Kron reloads its, its shells. Thank you, Leopard, for pushing me. Uh, okay, well, we're still able to get the shot out, which is pretty nice. Okay, not bad. Let's reload again. We got the concept, and I'm not too worried about the concept right now. We're going to activate our super speed. We're going to head right in there. And I am not really worried at this point. This should be a very, very easy win. We're going to push right towards the E6. And uh, well, actually, we also got the boss shot to own in front of us. Let's just aim it on him for our first shot. There you go. Nice, easy shell, and bonk, 389 damage into that player there as well. The great thing about a vehicle like the Kron is even when you have, you know, super high DPM players like this Leopard who are constantly farming your damage, it's not that big of an issue because you're an auto-reloader. You always have shells in the clip, and we can see that here. The only problem is that this game's kind of just a steamroll, so we don't have enough mobility to get the shells out. But in terms of the overall DPM, we're doing fine. We got a nice 409 damage shell into this waffle once. Nice 416 for the second shot. We're already over 3,000 damage, and that's why I dumped the clip there. I wanted to secure 3,000 damage in this game, which is exactly what we were able to do. So this concept's going to show us the side of his turret. However, we're not able to get the shell out, but we might just be able to squeeze a shell. Ow. Oh, 15 damage. Unfortunate. Yeah, this was kind of a steamroll, and... We had plenty of damage per minute to get out more shells, just it was a 7-0. In these situations, yeah, you're going to be fighting for damage. Your mobility's not enough to really deal with people. Um, so yeah, that Leopard probably got a decent chunk out, and so did the 62A. So not too bad at all. We still did top on the Steam. We still did over 3,000 damage. And again, great example of even in these stressful situations, I'm still able to get out over 3,000, which is, I'm honestly surprised we did there. It's unfortunate that Waffle is running Spall Liner, because we could have done a little bit more if he wasn't. Alright, this is a smaller map, being Fort Despair, and obviously the smaller the map, the better for a vehicle like this. We don't need to worry about having to drive back and forth and being out of breath by the time we get there. We're going to use our super speed boost, and we're going to head right over towards this spot on the map. Will our team support us? No clue, but we're going to find out. I really like going over towards the mid spot because it deals with the mediums, it deals with the heavies if they try to make their way over here. We're going to use that super speed, and we're chilling at 40 kilometers per hour right now. You can see that uh, the tank is fairly mobile when you have the speed boost activated. It's why I run it on the tank over reticle calibration. 
So we are going to get right into this spot in the base cap. And the best thing about this on encounter is that you're in the base cap, which means you're also basically forcing the enemy to get into the base while you're doing this. Why are T100 LTs in the base? Yeah, that's a bit of a Sussler uh, thing, but hey, we got a shell into the Kara, which is pretty nice. We have a faster... Oh, okay. Well, I guess it doesn't matter if I have a faster engine clip than the Kara if my shell does that. But we still get the second shell out. And uh, that's a situation where I'm always going to dump my reserve shell. Because this tank doesn't really have reserve shells. Yeah, 200 I think you're learning your lesson on why you probably shouldn't drive your light tank into the base cap. But I think that Grill's going to learn his lesson very quickly as well because uh, yeah, he's going to get absolutely nuked. So we have the Fosh in front of us here, and the Fosh only has one shell. He actually bounces us with that shot as well. We're going to load in another heat shell, slam it right into the side. So we're basically a double shot tank right now. For every shot we receive, we're shooting back two, and that's always a win. Especially because, again, nothing's petting me. The armor on this vehicle is incredibly robust, and it's very hard to actually deal with. The only thing I'm worried about is the Karo on my side, but that's alright. We've already got our clip almost reloaded here. And with that, we're just going to turn our turret slowly, slowly, slowly. Three, two, one, and the E4 bounces, which means we're able to get one shell into the Karo. And we're going to reload two shells into the Karo. And our final reload... Oh, that works as well. Fosh gets the clear. Not bad. All right, we chill, we reload, and actually it's beneficial that we didn't have to shoot our last shell, because again, the more you eat into the clip, the less effective damage per minute you have. So in five seconds, we will have our last shell loaded. We're going to aim it on the Fosh. Three. Oh, he bounces me again. That's very, very sad for you, good sir. All right, let's aim it on that Fosh. Oh, Sag. Either way, doesn't really matter. We're already up to 2,600 damage. That's a lot, especially for uh, a Kron. That's pretty good early game damage. Now we're going to drive up the hill on the Type 71 here. We're going to get one heat shell right into his tank. We're going to reload again. We're going to get a second heat shell into his vehicle. And there you go. That's 3,300 damage dealt. There's one tank I've not seen this entire game, and that is the enemy E100. Is he AFK? That would be my prediction. He is not AFK, though. He's actually all the way in our spawn. Very odd. Very stupid player. But, uh, oh well. We're going to obviously head directly to the spawn then. We're going to see if we can get some damage out into this tank. Now again, the great thing about this vehicle is while we're driving over there, we're reloading our clip. This is where auto-reloaders feel fantastic, is if you're in a single-shot tank, you're basically losing DPM to me as I'm getting in the position here. So we're just going to chill. We do get shot for 640. That's not a problem for me at all. We finally have our shells loaded now, so we're just going to get right behind the C100. I am going to dump the full clip. Oh, okay. That made a lot of sense. Thank you, Wargaming, for uh, showing me the wonderful wonderful armor department you have here, but shouldn't matter too much. We still did 4,460 damage and did a lot. So again, the Kron is a fantastic vehicle and this is a great example. You just sit there like nobody knows how to deal with you. When you're up against players that really just, I mean, honestly, even good players, if I'm going up against a skilled player in a Kron on a map like Dead Rail or it really any map that has a hill, I'm worried, because there's not much I'm really going to be able to do to that tank when it's in that position, especially if the player knows how to use it properly. The best thing to do is realistically ignore the Kron, go somewhere else, and don't let it shoot you. But obviously, if there's other tanks near you and they let the Kron shoot them, it's still going to be one of those situations where it's not going too well for your team. You know, normally I'd say, well, the vehicle doesn't have a lot of DPM, so it's not the biggest issue, but now that it actually has de decent damage per minute, the Kron can definitely be a big threat to your team's overall existence and their capabilities of winning. Speaking of a map with a hill, we have now arrived on mines for our last game. We do have some nasties up against us, a Fosh 155, a 183, an M6 show, a Kron, like that's a lot of dangerous vehicles. Even the 50 TP in Conway they have, pretty strong tanks in general. But, not too worried, judging down to the fact that we obviously feature really, really good mobility to get up to the hill with our super speed boost activated. And I think that we should be able to outplay their their players. Um, I'm not too worried about that. So up we go. You can see that with our super speed boost activated, we're going at about the same mobility as the E5 here, which is quite nice. Unfortunately, our Sheridan not only missed the shot, but has literally just gotten outplayed eight ways to Sunday compared to the uh, enemy boss shot and, and our E5 blocks me, makes me over poke, and loses me 750 health to the enemy Conway in the back, so that's really annoying. But if we can get that boss shot to cleared, it will be worth it. So, yeah, I mean, I had to bleed some health for that, which was honestly really annoying, but uh, we, we still got him cleared, which is the most important thing. We got one shell into the enemy Fosh. We got two shells into the enemy Fosh. We have the 183 in the back. 
obviously going to shoot out the 183 over a Fosh 155. I mean, the 183 is a much bigger threat in that regard. So, we're already up to a solid chunk of damage. 1,570. That's a lot when you think about it. And even though that Conway definitely appears to have a couple brain cells, as he's actually penned us with a Hesha on the side, and he's obviously seeming to know what he's doing, it's not the biggest issue ever, as we are still getting out some pretty nasty shots. So there we go, a nice 440 damage shell into that player there. Will the Conway poke? That is the question. Let me angle my hull up this way, so that if the Conway does indeed poke, at least we are, uh, we're hiding our weak spots. Oh, there you go, 183 pokes. He's dead. L play there. Big L play. Um, yeah, that's the problem with the 183. Its camo values are just so bad that in a lot of situations you try using it, you're going to be detected, which is not obviously what you want. But it's fine for me. I'm going to take advantage of that every day of the week. So we have the Yo, and the Yo is trying to make his way up the hill, it would appear. Uh, let's just back up and let's see if we can get some shells into his... T oh, okay. That made a lot of sense. Let's try that again. We get one shell into the side of the Yo. Two shells into the side of the Yo. That guy's running the 300 Alpha gun, so it's not like I'm really worried about his vehicle at all. And he just got absolutely nuked as well. So at this point, we reload our clip, and we're going to head over towards our vk 4502 b who appears to be in a bit of a problematic situation. I don't know... Oh, that's why the 4 is asking for help. Dude's got 200 health. Yeah, I don't know why he jumped down there. That was a really bad play on his part. We got five more seconds left, and we should have our clip loaded, and then we might be able to get some damage out. There's the 50 TP. We're going to go for his track wheel. There you go, one shell. Unfortunately, it doesn't track him, but that one does, as we damaged his track before. He can't pen me at all, but that Conway is still shooting us with Hess shells in the side. That's a very annoying player, I have to admit. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say, dude's, dude's actually getting us quite good. I didn't think we were over poking that much, but it, it, again, it doesn't really matter. We still have a thousand health left, and that's the that's the great thing about being an auto loader and being a heavy as well. Say you have a lot of health. The cron shoots at the VK, and at this point, I'm gonna try and push this cron because I know that he's out of shells. So if we just drive right out in the open, there you go. He's already shot one of his uh, shells. Oh, but the Conway still manages to hit us from that angle. Well, I guess that Conway just outplayed us every time we uh, we made a, a poke. I mean, it doesn't matter. We did a lot of damage. We're going to get a win. But I am incredibly surprised that from where we were poking, not only was the Conway able to hit me with the Cron blocking the shell. Uh, yeah, just surprising, to be honest. But, hey, we got a win, so I can't get too mad. That guy literally must have gotten like 2,600 HP off of us, though. Bonk, there goes the kill. And there you have it, a pretty solid game, so I can't get too mad at all. Definitely got farmed a bit, but uh, hey, if you're if you're taking shots with the team, I guess is not too bad. Let's take a look at how much damage we were able to deal. Yeah, 5,100, so I really can't get too pressed about it. That's a very good example. But yeah, that Conway, basically all of his damage was probably from farming us. All right, well, there you have it. That's the Kron, an absolutely amazing tank. The whole line is fantastic. We really only had bad luck with the Emil 1, and that's just sometimes how teams are. But the Emil 2 and Kron, we had win after win after win, and it was so easy due to the way this vehicle plays, the fact that you can dominate a ridgeline. Let me know what you guys think about this line and the overall tanks, in your opinion, in the comments down below. But I, well, today averaged 4,200 damage in the three battles we played in this tank, which is pretty solid. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.